Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the aggregate supply curve, so the other half of our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And then once we have this introduced, we will move on to talking about our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. Now, okay, building up the aggregate demand curve was a few weeks in the process. We had to go through our Keynesian cross from there. We had a whole bunch of math, and then from that, we built up our aggregate demand. Uh, not quite the same for aggregate supply. At the 104 level, we're just going to be doing a lot of hand waving. We're going to be doing a lot of kind of bit of fluffy talking about what we mean by aggregate supply, what's going on here, but it's not nearly as involved mathematically at this level to build it up. So let's go jump over. Let's take a look at what the background is on this aggregate supply, introduce it, and move on to figuring out macroeconomic equilibrium. Without further ado, let's go take a look. Okay, so paraphrasing a little bit, we've already taken a look at the Keynesian cross and included in that is going to be Keynes's law, which is essentially, right, one of the assumptions that we made, which was demand creates its own supply. And I'm paraphrasing, this is no record of this actually explicitly being said as this, but it's the basic idea. And it's that assumption we kind of looked at with the Keynesian cross was that, hey, it's a demand driven economy. People demand it. They said, hey, I want to spend my money on this and firms could just magically provide it. And that was the idea of our demand driven our demand, uh, demand centered of the Keynesian cross. <clears throat> on the other side of this, we have what is known as says law, which is, again, never actually said explicitly, but implied, is that supply creates its own demand. And right, this is, you can point to many cases where this is the case, right? Way back when, way back when now, before there was anything like a smartphone, well, Apple went and they created the iPhone. And then from that creation of the iPhone, all of a sudden we had supply of smartphones. And hey, by the creation of that, by beginning to supply smartphones, they created demand for smartphones. So, okay, to a degree, maybe this is actually the case as well. That, hey, it's not just we want this, so firms make it. But also firms go and they make stuff that we then say, hey, I like that. I want it. So, uh, and to a degree, supply creates its own demand. So Keynes law, this here, this is, well, this is easy to remember. Keynes law, Keynesian cross is really what we were getting at there. Keynesian cross, which then went to our aggregate demand side. Right in this side here, we were focusing on expenditure, what we wanted to expend our money on, what we wanted to demand and the like. A lot of this was determined by our income, how much money we had available to us, which then in turn is determined through labor markets and the like. Says law, well, says law, S really is the way that I remember this, says law for supply. This guy is going to be really the nuts and bolts behind our aggregate supply diagram, our aggregate supply curve. And really, we're just going to do a whole bunch of hand waving here, and we're going to just right away jump into introducing our aggregate supply curve. So same axes that we were looking at earlier, price level to real output, and we're gonna draw our aggregate supply curve as something like this. It's gonna be flat, slowly increasing, and then approaching, oh, I kinda of have it doubling back on itself. That's not really gonna be the case. It's going to get uh, steep. There we go. Not necessarily doubling back. And this is going to be our aggregate supply curve. Now, okay, the focus on our aggregate supply curve is going to be kind of our growth focus. So we go back a few chapters when we were talking about economic growth and, hey, the ways that we can increase our output. How can we produce more stuff year after year after year? All of these factors, these are the kind of things that influence our aggregate supply because that's what our aggregate supply is talking about. It's talking about our output. <clears throat> so aggregate supply, the shape, where it's located, if it's going to be shifting to the left or shifting to the right, 
is going to be determined by things such as input costs. And one of those big input costs is going to be factor prices. And what, 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 are, we, what are factor prices? Well, factor prices, that's, that's a C, factor prices are factors of production. So biggest factor price we're going to be focusing on because, hey, it affects you and I, the most of the people out here, is going to be the wage rate. Of course, there is also other factor prices such as the rental rate for capital and the like, or the cost of land, et cetera, et cetera. But our focus, our focus will be on the wage rate as we move forward. Additionally, what else can influence the cigarette supply curve? Well, we could also look at technology slash weather and with that kind of this notional idea of productivity, how productive our labor force is altogether. And typically speaking, not always, but typically technology, hey, we have some new technology which makes us more productive. It allows us to produce more, all else constant. That is, the agrid supply curve shifts to the right. Weather, natural disaster, war, famine, disease, all of these things typically decrease our productive capabilities. And thus, there would be negative weather technology shocks, making us less productive and thus shifting our agrid supply curve to the left. Since we started at the bottom with technology and weather, let's carry our way up here. So factor prices. Again, if we focus in on wages, so the cost of labor, we could imagine, again, all else equal for a fixed price level. If our wages were to be pushed up, and again, that'd be if all factor prices were to be pushed up for a fixed price level, well, that would in, eat into the profitability of the firms, the ability to break even. And as a result, higher factor prices, higher wages would mean less output. You wouldn't be able to produce as much as you once were able to because more of your costs are going towards labor, going towards buying capital, going towards buying land, etc. So if wages go up, we would expect the aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. Very similarly, if factor prices were to drop, we would expect the aggregate supply curve, the amount of output we were able to do for a fixed price level to increase, and thus the aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. Input costs, what are these? Well, these are other inputs into our production process, our raw materials, our energy, oil, uh, natural resources, lumber, logs, etc., etc., etc. So very similar in this as to our factor prices. If energy price were to go up, it costs more money to make electricity. Well, hey, that's now an input into a lot of our production processes. So higher cost of electricity more cost of production for a fixed price level, won't be able to produce as much, aggregate supply will go to the left. If input costs are dropping, well, we'll be able to produce more of them, so falling input costs will cause the aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. Okay, so we've talked a lot already about, not a lot, but that's about as much as we have to say about the aggregate supply curve and what's determinants, what causes it to shift to the right, shift to the left, but we kind of overlooked right off the start Hey, what gives it its shape? Why does it have this little shape? We said, hey, it's going to have this increasing kind of shape, starting off almost flat, increasing, and then ending up almost vertical. Well, what we can do is we can actually break this aggregate supply curve into three distinct zones. So the first zone is this flat zone here, and this is what we would call the Keynesian zone. And in this Keynesian zone, this is essentially our demand determined area, right? We have a flat aggregate supply curve, meaning that, hey, if we just start to demand more and more and more output, well, the result would just be that, hey, firms could produce more and more stuff at a constant price level or with very little increase in price as we go along. That is, this is low levels of output. At this point here, firms have a lot of excess capacity. They can just ramp up their production at this point without having to pass on costs. As our level of real output increases, we enter into our intermediate zone. Intermediate zone. And in this section here, we now have a trade-off between producing more and increased costs of production. 
So that is in order to be able to produce more and more and more stuff, it's going to end up costing us more because we have to use up more material. We don't have the space. We don't have the efficiencies available to us as much anymore. So as a result of that, we have our intermediate zone. Finally, up in the far right here, we have our neoclassical zone. And in this neoclassical zone, what the belief is, is that the economy is quite heated. We have a lot of production already happening. Firms are already at their full capacity. And if you were to increase your demand, if you were to say, hey, we need more stuff, the only thing firms could do is just increase the price, right? They might be able to increase output a little bit, but disproportionately, any request for more and more stuff is just going to result in higher and higher and higher price levels. That is, the neoclassical belief is that, hey, our firms are already operating at peak efficiency, at peak capacity. Any extra request for more stuff is just going to be a surge in demand that cannot be met and be entirely translated into new prices, new higher prices. So the idea with our aggregate supply is in fundamentally these three zones. That's the idea behind it at least. What we're going to presume, and actually let's just go back to take a look at this to kind of show this point. What we're going to presume is that as we go and overlay our aggregate demand on top of this, in order to get our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium, is that we are essentially just zoomed in on one spot of this curve. And that is, you can imagine if we zoomed in far enough just on one spot of this curve, it would essentially end up looking something like this. We would have our axes, of course. That would be our price level and our real output. And we'll presume because we're just dealing with a small section of the aggregate supply curve, we're going to presume that, hey, it just looks linear as such. And that there's just for simplicity of drawing it, just so that we don't have these different zones that we have to keep in mind. Now, ideally, we'd like to remember them. Theoretically, they are there. Theoretically, it's something that we want to reference to. But from our purposes here at this 104 level, we are zoomed in on one area such that for all intents and purposes, we just have like this, just one line upward sloping somewhere near that intermediate zone. Okay. If we overlay with this then our aggregate demand, we would have downward sloping, right? We've derived this aggregate demand in our last video bit, and that is from our Keynesian cross. And we see that, okay, the two overlap, and where the two overlap, where they intersect each other, well, at that point, at that point right there, we end up getting our short run macroeconomic equilibrium. So that is at that point, we get a level of output. That's our short run level of GDP, our short run level of output. And we get correspondingly our short run price level. That is, hey, what our price level is, what you could imagine that price level, as we said before, that could be measured as either the consumer price index or as the GDP deflator. So, hey, price level, we could say, right, to start off, maybe this is our base here, so we could call that 100 for that initial point. Why exactly is this an equilibrium? Well, in order to identify why this is an equilibrium and why this is going to hold, it's important, of course, to take a look at our disequilibrium situations and why anytime we're in disequilibrium, natural market forces bring us back to this equilibrium point. So, Let's go take a look at that. Let's go talk about this idea of disequilibrium in order to understand equilibrium. So to start off, let's take a look at a situation where say we have what I'll call price low. So right, this is a low price level altogether in our economy. Let's say this is something like 90. And what we would witness is that at this low price level, well, okay, we would have our corresponding value, our level of output from our aggregate supply. And we would have very similarly our aggregate demand. That is the amount that we would want to spend from our expenditure approach, right? This low price level, hey, we have some amount of income 
We are willing to expend this high amount. But here's the problem. We're willing to expend this high amount, but firms, firms aren't really willing to produce very much at this low price. The result? Well, we are really willing to expand. We're ready to expand. That is already part of our plan and part of our budget. And so as a result, as we plan to expand, firms say, okay, wow, you're ready to buy this much stuff? Okay, we have to meet this demand. So firms begin to ramp up their production. But as they ramp up their production, it can't be satisfied in just increasing output. This isn't just our Keynesian model that's demand determined and, hey, we can ramp up production without increasing costs. No, no, no. As they ramp up their production, well, the costs of production begin to increase too. So as a result, they ramp up along the aggregate supply curve, moving along and up it. At the same time, okay, we were willing to expend this amount here, this is like, hey, wow, low price, we're willing to buy lots and lots of stuff. But as firms respond to that, they try to satisfy this demand for goods, they try to satisfy this expenditure, but as they do, they end up increasing the price. Now we saw already with our Keynesian cross model that, hey, as prices go up, real consumption falls, real investment falls, real government expenditure exports fall. That is, as prices go up, our Keynesian cross shifted down to the left. So as a result of that, as prices rise, we move along <clears throat> our aggregate demand curve. And that is, as prices rise, we update our real expenditure and allow it to fall. And in that case there, that falling real expenditure, that rising output, at increasing costs meets and we get our equilibrium level of national, well, sorry, our short run macroeconomic equilibrium, our equilibrium level of output and prices rising and we get our equilibrium corresponding price point. Average price, again, you can think of that like our consumer price index or our GDP deflator. Okay, but what about from the other side? What if we had, instead of a low price, what if we had a high price? So let's go price high, something up here, right in price high. Maybe this is something like 110 as our price level in comparison to what our current equilibrium is there at 100. Well, we see in this case that the amount we're planning to expend, the amount of stuff that we're like, oh, this is the amount of stuff I'd be able to buy given the prices, given my income and all of that. Well, that's pretty low. At the same time, at this high price level, firms, firms are quite happy to produce a lot of stuff, and so they're willing to produce this massive amount of stuff. Well, the problem is they're producing all of this cool stuff, but we can't buy it. Firms are producing it, but they can't sell it. So the result in this case here is that in order to be able to liquidate, in order to be able to sell their stuff, they need to be able to lower their price as they lower their price, though, they're not going to be willing to produce nearly as much. And so we begin our transition along the aggregate supply curve back towards our equilibrium. This here has the effect of causing our prices to fall. That is our prices to fall as the amount of output our suppliers are able to make falls. As our output falls, as our prices fall, well, falling prices, hey, lower prices, that's more real consumption, more real investment, et cetera, et cetera. That's a movement along our aggregate demand curve. And the falling prices result in an increase in our aggregate expenditure, our aggregate demand, ending up at our short run macroeconomic equilibrium. And again, we have this equilibrium being maintained. So, okay. That's the idea of our short run macroeconomic equilibrium. From here, what we end up having is we have shocks to our system that end up influencing our level of GDP and our price level in the short run. What, what exactly are these shocks? Well, ultimately they can be classified into two categories. We can have supply shocks.
Supply shocks. Now these are, as we talked about, these are things that are going to cause changes to our input prices, our factor prices, or changes in technology, weather, or as we said, productivity. That is essentially these supply shocks are things that are going to influence our ability to produce, our ability to make output. If we have some kind of shock that happens that makes us be able to produce more, well, then our aggregate supply will shift to the right, right? And that's something that causes us to be able to produce more for a fixed price level, right? That is, again, if we were to assume 100 as a fixed price level, hey, if prices were constant, could I produce more given the shock or could I produce less given the shock? And right, we talked about briefly before what that would be, what would cause a grid supply to shift one direction versus the other. We would also have our aggregate demand, and in that we would have our demand shocks. And demand shocks, now these are due to shifts in our Keynesian cross model. So that would be shifts due to everything that we'd previously looked at in that Keynesian cross case. So underneath the demand shocks, they could be things that influence our marginal propensity to spend. That is our induced portion. So changes in taxes or changes in our marginal propensity to import. Or they can be demand shocks that are influencing our autonomous expenditure. So that's something that's influencing our autonomous consumption. So expectations, wealth, interest rates something that's influencing our autonomous investment. So again, expectations, changes, unexpected changes in sales, or real interest rates. Changes in government expenditure. So changes in government expenditure, this would just be, hey, the government decides to spend more for this reason, or they decide to cut back their spending for that reason, right? Again, government expenditure just ends up being what we say that it is. Finally here, we have our autonomous exports and autonomous exports being influenced by changes in foreign income or changes in relative prices, that is changes in exchange rates. So as any of those guys change, that will change our autonomous expenditure and thus be a demand shock one direction or the other. As that happens, if we have a shock to one or the other, we get a momentary disequilibrium and then an adjustment to a new short run equilibrium. So let's, let's discuss, let's take a look at an example, one of a demand shock, one of a supply shock, and work through how exactly that works out in the short run. So to start us off, let's work through one that we've talked about already, and that is, let's suppose that all of a sudden our stock market booms, and a booming stock market, well, what exactly does that mean? What is that really getting at? Well, okay, to work through it, we have, it could be a supply shock or it could be a demand shock. Supply shock, well, this isn't going to influence any input prices. This isn't going to input um, influence any factors. It's not a technology. It's not any weather or any influence to our productivity or ability to produce anything. This is just this extra event out there, stock market booms. So, okay, what is this influencing? Is this influencing our tax rate? No, no, no. Our propensity to import stuff? No, nothing to do with imports there. Uh, what about over on the autonomous side? Well, if the stock market's booming, everybody who's saved money in the stock market, all of a sudden their savings has increased. Not their rate of savings, right? Not their savings function, but the amount their stock of savings has increased. That stock of savings, that is going to be. Oh, I can't write. That is going to be that their wealth has increased. So, okay, as their wealth has increased, that has been an increase in our autonomous consumption. Now, the other side of this that you could think about is, okay, booming stock market. Well, if the stock market's booming, well, then we're going to have, hey, things are going good. Things maybe will continue to go good. Maybe this is also a sign that we have positive expectations of the future. So, okay, if we have positive expectations of the future, that's great. That's an increase in consumption. That's an increase in investment. Either way, 
what this means, booming stock market, whether you want to attribute that to the rising wealth or take this as, hey, this is a positive expectation for the future. The ultimate impact on this is that autonomous expenditure is increasing. That is, if we want to work through what that means for our Keynesian cross model, right? And sometimes this is helpful just to quickly draw it in the margins here. So let's do that. Okay, we have our Keynesian cross. We have our planned aggregate expenditure. We have our real income. We're going to have our 45 degree line here such that Y equals planned aggregate expenditure. And then we're going to have our actual aggregate expenditure model itself. So there's my autonomous. There's my PAE. So there we go. Autonomous PAE. And where was I? Boom. There was my initial equilibrium national income, right? So that guy there, ah, that goes corresponds to that guy, right? Okay, but then what happened? We had boom in consumption, boom in investment. That is our autonomous expenditure increased. So let's jump to green here. So autonomous expenditure increased. That is now. Planned aggregate expenditure is something like that. Parallel lines to the best that I could just freehand them in this small space here. So, okay, there we go. Planned aggregate expenditure, new national equilibrium. Hey, what happened? Our equilibrium level of national income increased. <clears throat> okay, given our Keynesian cross, that is our equilibrium level of national income just increased given a fixed price level. So, hey, Keynesian cross, aggregate demand. This is all happening for a fixed price level, meaning, hey, okay, we take this fixed price level, drag it out. Maybe we're something like this now. Uh-oh, where's that? That's not on any curve. That's just a point out in the abyss. Well, okay. The reason why that's happened is because we've had a shift in our Keynesian cross. The Keynesian cross derives our demand curve. So, hey, a change in the Keynesian cross for a fixed price level causes a change in our aggregate demand curve. So we would expect to witness our aggregate demand curve shifting out to the right. That is, we would get a new parallel aggregate demand. Oh, I kind of missed the line there. There we go. A new aggregate demand curve looking something like that. We can call that aggregate demand prime. So this booming stock market, increase in wealth or positive expectations, however you want to look at that, caused consumption, investment to rise, autonomous expenditure to rise, all of that, increasing our equilibrium GDP for a fixed price level, right? We would have, you could go in Y prime one there. That would be for a fixed price level. There we go. We could draw that down, real Y prime one. But hey, now we have disequilibrium, right? We have disequilibrium. We have this new aggregate demand. That is, keep in mind, anytime we have a shift, it's like this old line just disappeared, right? It's no longer there. So, okay, we have this new, we have this disequilibrium, short run disequilibrium. We have our expenditure, right? Our short run, or sorry, our equilibrium level of national income from our Keynesian cross. We have our real output, the amount of stuff we're actually producing. But hey, we're planning to expand all of this. So what ends up happening? Firms want to satisfy that. They try to increase their production. By increasing their production, they also increase the price. As prices increase, well, we, uh, we can't really consume this much in the end. Higher prices is falling real consumption. So we move along each of the curves until we wind up back at our equilibrium and it's a new equilibrium now and as a result of this we have some new price so i'm just going to make up a number of 105 right so we've had an increase in prices and as a result we've also have a new equilibrium short run macroeconomic equilibrium and that there is real gdp 2 real y prime 2 so we have our effect of this positive demand shock.
One thing to keep in mind, one thing to note with this, and this is a bit of an interesting thing to note, if you go back to our previous video where we were deriving the aggregate demand, we saw that, hey, this vertical shift, so not vertical, this horizontal shift of our aggregate demand curve, that is the magnitude that it shifted for a fixed price level. So here I have that little green bar drawn out. We said that, hey, this change in Y prime was going to be equal to our multiplier times the change in autonomous. And we could work it out that way there. So that was from white real GDP all the way to real GDP prime one. That there was our shift in our aggregate demand curve, the horizontal magnitude of it. What we witness is that our change in our short run macroeconomic equilibrium, though, is actually less. That is, it was initially right there at real GDP, but it only ended up at real GDP prime two. Much smaller final effect as everything worked its way through. Why? Why, why is that? Why do we have a smaller effect? Why does GDP not increase all the way? multiplier times the change in autonomous well the rationale behind that the reason behind that is because we've had rising prices right so as prices rose well our amount that we wanted to expand the amount of stuff we wanted to buy that began to decrease because higher prices means less real consumption less real investment less real expenditure altogether so as a result of increasing prices well, the change in output in the end, we can change this a bit, that final equilibrium to equilibrium for a demand shock, for an autonomous expenditure demand shock, we can say that the change in Y prime, I guess real Y prime, is always gonna be less than or equal to the multiplier times the change in autonomous. So any time that we have an autonomous demand shock, the final equilibrium change, right? So from initial equilibrium to new equilibrium, short run macroeconomic equilibrium, that change, it will always be less than or equal to the multiplier times the change in autonomous. So in this case here, we don't have this full multiplier times autonomous because we end up having changes in prices. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at this time at a supply shock and let's take a look at how that works out. Let's pick a supply shock that's not necessarily as explicit as some of the others, right? Like I could pick an explicit one like, oh, price of energy and input to our production process all of a sudden increases. And you're like, oh, price of energy, that's an input. Input price. Okay, hey, I can work that through. Or all of a sudden we have a decrease in rates of unionization. Decrease in rates of unionization means that average wages begin to fall across the nation. Oh, average wages. Those are a factor price. Factor prices fall. I can work that out. Let's, let's take a look at one that's a bit more ambiguous. <clears throat> let's suppose that we have a massive forest fire that cripples the nation's manufacturing industry, right? And we'll presume that manufacturing is a good part of our output, right? This is a, this is a good size of our altogether, our national output. So, right, and very similar, right? We could say, hey, a hurricane has hit, shutting down our ability to refine natural gas or refine oil. Um, a massive winter storm hit, making it so that nobody can get to work, right? All of these things. And no one can get to work for, we can say, several weeks or a month. So it actually has a tangible impact, right? In this case here, though, massive forest fire shuts down, cripples our nation's manufacturing. Well, okay, I already said, hey, this is a supply shock, right? We said that was going to be our next example. What exactly is the impact of this? Well, got to kind of think about this. Big forest fire cripples our nation's manufacturing. That is, hey, because we've had a forest fire, we've had to evacuate people. We can no longer show up to work. We can no longer manufacture stuff. So that is just 
or a fixed price level, still price level of 100, nothing's influencing this yet, for this fixed price level of 100, all of a sudden, I'm just stuck producing less stuff. I just cannot make as much stuff as I used to be able to because I can't show up to work. My workers cannot show up because of this forest fire. Maybe my factory has been destroyed, right? It's I can't even produce stuff even if my workers could show up to work because my factory has been burnt down. So all of this has reduced our productive capability. It has decreased our ability to make output, to make stuff. As a result, we have lower output. As a result of this lower output, our aggregate supply curve has thus shifted to the left. So aggregate supply shifting to the left. Where does that bring us? Something like that. We get aggregate supply prime. We see again, we have this initial disequilibrium. Prices begin to adjust up, increasing output in other ways where we can. As prices go up, our demand for these good, for the real goods and services, the amount of real stuff that we're able to buy begins to fall. And we make our way to our new short run macroeconomic equilibrium. And at this new point, we have, oh, let's keep that as a straight line. Our new value of output and our new price level. And what we see here is a new price level. I'm going to pick 105 again, just because. So we witnessed an increase in prices and a fall in our GDP. So that is what we would expect to have witnessed here is the amount of stuff we're able to produce is less and we're able to produce less stuff, but it's all going to cost more. So, hey, that sucks. We get less stuff to buy, less stuff to consume, right? This is all the other output, expenditure, income, GDP, all of that is less and it all costs more. So we're paying more for less stuff. That sucks, that's, that's a lousy case. But that's the essence of a negative supply shock. Okay, as we've gone through this video, we've introduced very briefly and in really the only level of detail we need for 104, our aggregate supply curve. From this aggregate supply curve, we built up our short run macroeconomic equilibrium, that is our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And then from there, we took a look at two different shocks. We looked at a demand shock through autonomous expenditure, and we took a look at a supply shock and we saw how that influences both our level of short run GDP, real output, as well as the impact it had on the price level. I would recommend you work through a bunch of questions on the different kind of shocks, taking a look at different things, being able to work out, hey, if I had a change in wealth, what would that mean? If I had a change in interest rates, what would that mean? If the government changed their tax rate, how would that work out? If wages changed, how would that work out? If cost of electricity changed, what would that do? Right? Work through those. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You can post in the comments below. You can post on the D2L Frequently Asked Questions page. And of course, you can always send me an email. We'll be putting together another video on working through a bunch of these shocks just for you to work through them, walk through them. But for the most part, that does us here. Our next video in this series will be introducing our long run and our adjustment from the short run to the long run, the impacts of that, the business cycle, and then tying together prices, output, unemployment, potential GDP, natural rates of unemployment, whole bunch of terms we've looked at throughout the whole semester, bringing all of these together. Thanks, until next time.